ladies and gentlemen, welcome the moderator of their next session, Vasil Hudak. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, afternoon session. Uh, greetings from Bratislava, uh, from uh, Globsec Forum. I have to say that uh, as a vice chair of uh, Globsec, I'm very happy to see that uh, we were able to put together this uh, event. Uh, this is the traditional event uh, uh, of Globsec, uh, but uh, frankly, even a few days or weeks ago, we were not sure whether we'll be able to uh, to make this hap uh, event happen because of the situation with COVID, but uh, we did it. I think the fact that uh, we are here, we are meeting, we continue the tradition, it already shows that uh, there is a strong resilience among the institutions of Europe and in Central Eastern Europe. So uh, I would like to uh, start this, uh, this discussion, this panel. Uh, the title is, as you know, Finding a Treatment for Our Ailing Global Economy. Um, maybe before going to the panel itself and introducing our panelists, I would like to just uh, give some organizational details. Uh, I would like to remind the audience online and also those in the room that they can ask questions and uh, uh, please keep the questions brief. Also, if you could uh, introduce yourself and the organization you are, uh, you are representing. There are three ways how to ask the question. Uh, from the audience in the room, please uh, raise your hand, uh, and when I give you the floor, come to the microphones. Actually, there is this one microphone, so for those in the room, please use the microphone. From uh, your tablet, the online registered participants uh, via the virtual platform, uh, type the question at live.globsec.org. And those who are connecting via Zoom into the virtual studio, uh, please do so via, via Zoom. Our session should last uh, for uh, about 40, 45 minutes, and uh, obviously we would like to give as much uh, opportunity to the audience, to those people here, but also linked uh, virtually to, to ask questions and to be part of this, of this discussion. We'll continue uh, on this stage also after the session, so those who want to come after the, uh, this panel, please uh, also stay tuned. Now, let me introduce our wonderful pan panel, and I would like to thank all of you who are connected uh, and who are part of this uh, discussion and the panel to, for, for your time and for your uh, willingness to, to join us. I will start with Ambassador Alan Wolf, uh, Deputy Director General at the World Trade Organization in Geneva. Ambassador, welcome, welcome to the panel. Pierre Helbron, a good friend, uh, Vice President for Policy and Partnerships from the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development in London. Pierre, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, Marion Janssen, uh, Trade and Agriculture Director from the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris. Good afternoon as well, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Sir Paul Collier, uh, Professor of Economics and Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government and Director of the International Growth Center in London. Sir. Welcome as well, and thank you for joining us. And uh, Abraham Liu, Chief Representative Officer of the, uh, to the EU institutions uh, for Huawei, based in Brussels. Abraham, also good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Afternoon. Great. So we have a wonderful panel. We have really, as you see, a very diverse group of uh, representatives of global institutions representatives of uh, academic institution as well as uh, uh, from a uh, uh, very important commercial institution, uh, which is uh, one of the drivers of, uh, of digitalization and automation in, in, uh, uh, globally. So I believe that this gives a very good opportunity to have, a, uh, have an interesting discussion. L let me start uh, so that we have a kind of warm-up session. Uh, if we could, uh, we could start with, a br with brief answers to basically a key question for today, which is uh, how do you see the global economy looking from your position, uh, from your institution? Uh, what, what do you think are the key elements and uh, is it really correct that uh, this is a, an ailing global economy? Um, so maybe if you could uh, spend two, three minutes on this kind of basic uh, uh, setting for the uh, for the panel. Uh, Ambassador, 
Could we start uh, with you from the World Trade Organization from Geneva, please? Mm -hmm. I think we have some troubles with the sound. Uh, could you maybe turn on the speaker? Yes, my apologies. Ah, wonderful. Uh, Thank you, Ambassador. Now we can hear you. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, yes. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, uh, we're grappling with some of the worst problems we've seen in terms of the economy and to world health, of course, in, in many years. A 4.8% decline in GDP is forecast for this year, the worst decline since World War II. Uh, the WTO has updated its forecast for trade in 2020. Merchandise trade will be down by 9.2% year to year. Um, this is uh, uh, about the same as we saw in the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. The good news, which is relatively good news, is that the projections had been in April that the world trade would decline by 13 to 32%. Uh, even a 13% decline would have been the worst drop since the Depression in the 1930s. So things are a little bit better than they would have been. Uh, this picture is not rosy uh, because services trade, of course, is deeply depressed. Um, and uh, we only see a 7.2% rise in merchandise trade for 2021 uh, with serious downside risks. Uh, the amount of second wave or continuation of the of the virus. Uh, so, um, yes, it's an ailing economy um, and uh, steps have been taken by governments to support it with massive fiscal and monetary action to mitigate this, the uh, pandemic's economic impact. Uh, but public authorities should not, uh, as uh, Christina Georgie uh, Georgieva has said at the IMF, not cut back uh, the flow of funds too soon because we need the confidence increasing. We need public spending to catalyze increased private investment, uh, spurring growth and reducing uh, debt burden. And from a WTO point of view, we need to keep international markets broadly open and uh, improve the system, which I'm happy to revert to uh, in our later discussion. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, now I'd like to move to uh, Pierre Helbron. Uh, how does it look, uh, Pierre, from uh, London and from the EBRD perspective? Thank you very much, Vasil, and uh, so happy to, 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 to find you here, even in this for virtual format. So, seen from, uh, from EBRD, uh, what has been already said is completely uh, applicable to our countries of operation, both the extraordinary uh, shock to to the economies of our countries of operation but uh, i would say uh, also uh, the response which has been given by the country countries themselves uh, but also the international response to the crisis we see we've learned lessons from uh, the global financial crisis and we've understood uh, after a phase where national government were very much on the front line, that cooperation matters uh, and that uh, at the end of the day, only a multilateral response can, can, can win, from liquidity assistance to funding research to stockpiles of essential supplies to just mention a few. And I think in a way uh, the eu is in in itself a, a model which has shown its resilience um but uh, beyond uh, beyond that i think uh, uh and that's a positive uh element uh, that uh, international uh, and european financial institutions have been able to uh, accompany and support our countries so that they pass at least this first phase of emergency 
uh, that uh, that we 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 encounter. Uh, I will not dwell on what EBRD or EIB or other institutions have done. We we, we may uh, discuss that later. But I think uh, this very strong message of support coordination, any especially in countries which do not have access to the same financing means as the most developing countries, is really something uh, which is uh, promising, and that we have to build on in the next uh, in the next month. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Uh, let's move to uh, to Paris. Uh, uh, Madame Janssen, uh, what do you, how do you see the situation from the OECD perspective? Um, our OECD perspective is uh, rather similar to the, um, the figures you have heard before from previous speakers. We have in our recently published interim economic outlook also spoken about a GDP drop of around 4.5% this year uh, with an expectation of GDP to grow by maybe 5% next year. Even with that growth, however, many countries will not be back to 2019 GDP levels in 2021. And there is a serious risk that GDP growth next year will be two to three percentage points lower than predicted if we go for a low growth scenario that, that will notably be determined by a potential second wave of the pandemic. When it comes to my field of um, responsibility trade, there uh, we have seen rather positive signals. As mentioned before, we have seen a sense by global policymakers that coordination is important. Uh, we have also seen that some mechanisms put in place in the last crisis, the financial crisis, have been helpful to stabilize markets. So trade dropped, but that was largely because of demand uh, changes and partly because of certain uh, logistical problems. But overall, uh, value chains have been relatively rather resilient and the trade drop was not um, was relatively lower than we could have expected looking at the GDP drop that we are facing. So a sobering situation right now with some hope for the future, but uh, but not too optimistic. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move to, to London. Uh, Sir Collier, uh, what, what is your opinion about the current status of economy globally? Yeah, well, I think um, what we've heard is a bit a bit too complacent, to be honest. Um, uh, the the global economy was already pretty sick um, before COVID, and um, uh, COVID has um, amplified those sicknesses. It's also revealed um, in stark form some of the weaknesses. Um, we'd focused on efficiency at the expense of resilience. And so the global system was really pretty fragile. I would also emphasize, um, alongside some coordination, there's been a lot of difference in policy response. It, back in January, nobody knew what to do. Um, uh, and that just reveals how very badly prepared we were for a, for really for an epidemic that ought to have been able to be anticipated. Um, if you look at the difference within the OECD, it's massive. A country like Denmark has had a pretty low economic hit and a pretty mort low mortality hit, whereas the USA um, has had a very high economic hit and a, a, an off-the-map high mortality hit. Um, so the idea that it's just a choice between um, the economy or mortality is actually wrong. Um, some countries have been able to manage both. Thank you. I think we'll dwell on this a little later uh, in more detail. Uh, but let's move to, uh, uh, to Brussels. Uh, uh, Mr. Liu from Huawei, um, how do you, um, maybe more from uh, at this point, not uh, Chinese perspective, but from the corporate perspective, how do you see the situation? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be joining this dis distinguished uh, panel for the Global Sake uh, today. And as you notice, uh, you know, uh, uh, to borrow a phrase from the American author Mark Twain, reports of my absence uh, have been greatly exaggerated. Uh, you have may heard some of the rumors about Huawei being excluded from this event. 
well, uh, we are here. Events like uh, Global Tech are about to debate free exchange of ideas, a chance for the business leaders, politicians, policymakers to come together to share views in a safe, open, and a secure environment. Freedom from the outside pressure, while we highly value tolerance and uh, pluralism, two sacred European values as enshrined in Article 2 of the treaty. For that reason, I decided to continue with my participation on this panel, and thank you very much, Mr. Op uh, Mr. Moderator, to give me this opportunity. Uh, one of the topics that I would like to address during this debate is that the equality, for me, this is the basis for sustainable human uh, progresses. Free trade and globalization are forces for good, unequal distribution of benefits, created, cr creates global tensions, inequity, inequality, instability, and poverty. On the other hand, the digital trade will create new opportunities for prosperity and more equal sharing. At the, time, at the same time, improving the global value chains will improve life for everyone. Deglobalization goes against the development of global value chains. Decoupling global value chains is not a good idea because it impacts the access to tech for uh, the access of uh, tech for everybody. Delays digitalization and innovation reduces choices and competition. But I am sure we will have plenty of opportunities to go more deep in, in depth on these issues with the distinguished panelists throughout the debate. While we we are you know uh, is uh, about the connectivity of the ICT infrastructure to support the, the the communication during the pandemic, you know tens of thousands of my colleagues work together with our customer, the operator to support events like this from happening, to make sure that the smooth, strong, robust network you know, is there to support the people uh, to, to fight for the common enemy, which is the, the, the coronavirus. With that, I want to thank you, Mr. Hudak, you know, for having me in this discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you all for this uh, warm-up part. Um, uh, let's maybe go deeper into some of the issues which you have already identified. Uh, one of those is certainly the importance of uh, global cooperation, free trade. Um, I think what we have seen so far as, a, uh, as one of the results or impact of uh, uh, corona crisis is the increase in protectionism, trade wars, uh, some of the issues which uh, we were already facing before, uh, they have become even more obvious, uh, such as uh, unresolved WTO disputes, uh, um, there is a kind of uh, inward looking uh, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, global trade, increase of nationalism, bo both at the political but also economic level. Um, so I would like to ask you, uh, let's discuss a little this topic itself. Uh, what can be done? Uh, because I think this is one of the key issues, how we, how we reignite, regenerate, uh, re re energize the global economy. Uh, by, uh, by making sure that the free flow of uh, goods, uh, of capital, can continue. So let's start with the WTO. Ambassador Wolf, uh, what, what do you think should be done to make sure that uh, global trade, uh, the global chains, economic chains, value chains, can continue to, to work even in this uh, uh, difficult environment of, uh, of, of COVID impact? Thank you very much. The, uh the response actually has been better than one would have anticipated. And while world trade is down, uh, trade in the essential products for uh, the COVID-19 situation, uh, for dealing with the pandemic, personal protective equipment uh, 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 and uh, the like, uh, experienced explosive growth. So 92% second quarter over second quarter, 2020 over 2019. Uh, just May to May was up 122%. Um, WTO uh, got very good cooperation from its members on notifying re restrictions and trade facilitation measures, and trade facilitation measures outnumbered uh, restrictive measures by quite a bit. Uh, so uh, there were, the initial responses were individual, then there came 
cooperation. Uh, Singapore and uh, Australia moved to make sure that trade flowed freely into their economies and out from their economies, uh, and others followed suit. Uh, Canada uh, led a group that uh, has uh, called for more openness and uh, committed to not putting on restrictions. Um, in order to deal with a crisis, one has several options. Stockpiling, uh, uh, having greater uh, inventories, and um, uh, 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 the degree of onshoring has actually been relatively limited. It has economic limits. Uh, stockpiling, the stockpiles tend to age and uh, end up not being uh, very effective. That was the experience in the United States, was the experience in some countries in Europe as well. Uh, you had to depend on trade and actually uh, trade has responded relatively well. What should we do going forward? Uh, we should uh, consider at the WTO, our members should consider, and the European Union has proposals that it's working on in this regard, uh, removal of tariffs on pharmaceuticals, for example. Uh, there already is a pharmaceutical agreement. It has not been updated since um, 2010. Uh, making sure the disciplines are responsive uh, that exist with respect to export restrictions. Um, and uh, these uh, considerations will come forward. What could we do? The agreement on agriculture, not on industrial goods, but on agriculture, uh, requires uh, countries putting on export restrictions to take uh, into account, have due consideration for the impact of those restrictions on other countries that they were shipping to. So taking a close look at the rules uh, is essential. Looking at uh, the rule on export restrictions, which calls for an equitable sharing of supply, is going to be particularly uh, uh, relevant when uh, vaccines are available uh, to have equitable sharing of international supplies. Um, the gentleman from Huawei mentioned uh, digital trade. The e-commerce negotiation should go to a successful conclusion. Uh, so holding the line on protection, um, uh, emphasizing international cooperation, perhaps having a standstill on new restrictive measures, making the trade facilitation agreement work, capacity building in developing countries to do so, uh, and trade finance. The WTO is not in charge of trade finance, but it has convening power. In the um, financial crisis, the WTO used that convening power to bring together the major banks, the international financial organizations, and look to trade finance, which has not recovered yet from the, um, from the financial crisis. Uh, WTO reform is going to be essential. We can perhaps get into that a little bit later, uh, but we have a new director general who will be chosen uh, in less than a month. And uh, I'm sure it's now going to be a she. We know the gender. We don't know the individual yet. Uh, that uh, she will move forward with respect to the reform agenda to make this place where you can uh, negotiate agreements, where you can settle disputes uh, in an acceptable way and uh, where the secretariat is uh, responsive to, to the needs. Uh, we're with cooperation with the OECD and other uh, major international organizations to uh, bring about that, that better future. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's uh, clear that uh, keeping uh, free trade, uh, keeping uh, uh, economic and production value chains alive is uh, critical for the economic recovery post-COVID. Um, I think we already observed at the time when uh, uh, lockdowns started in Europe uh, in March, April uh, this year, when it was uh, really critical uh, that uh, European countries were able to get very quick supplies of uh, pharmaceutical products uh, and equipment from, uh, from China um, and other Asian countries. And uh, this, uh, I think, is very important for the global economy to, uh, to be able to, to, to survive and to, uh, to get from the current situation. Nevertheless, um, I would like to go to, actually to Paris and to OECD, um, because we see different responses um, in terms of public policies uh, to the impact of COVID uh, and how to deal with COVID. Uh, we see also um, uh, different uh, 
uh, ways how national economies are behaving in this environment. Um, from the OECD as, the, as a global think tank, I would say, uh, do, do you think that the situation and the impact of COVID may change the global uh, economic configuration? Uh, is it just, uh, I would say, um, an event which is going to, um, uh, to multiply and uh, accelerate uh, those trends which were already obvious, uh, like moving the economic uh, uh, center of uh, global economy to, uh, to, to China, to Asia? Or are there some new developments? And what do you think, who are the winners and losers in this uh, COVID environment? Please, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, mm. I, of course I meant uh, I would... Madam Janssen. Yes. Um, I would say um, a big change, and here I go maybe back to something that Sir Collier said uh, that has come about from this crisis, is a concern about what movement of people means. Um, I had the pleasure to edit uh, recently a, a volume called uh, Women Shaping Global Economic Governance. And one of the themes that came up there was the theme of trust. Trust of people in global finance, trust in institutions that are responsible for the distribution of the gains from globalization, trust in information, and trust in the digital economy. I think we should ask, ask, add after this crisis the trust in border movements of people. And that's also, in my view, one of the major issues we have um, ahead of us if we want to re-energize the global economy, as you uh, just mentioned and asked for. When it comes to trade, I have the impression that COVID-19 has given us a rather positive message around trade. The private sector, unlike many governments, was prepared for this type of crisis. Value chains had risk management strategies in place and were able to buffer off the worst of the crisis, That's why we, of the shock. That's why we have seen trade continuing quite well. We also had said after the last crisis, play, um, um, systems in place that would help in this shock. I'm thinking here above all of the agricultural market information system. The OECD is involved in this like other international organizations. That system has given us during the crisis um, information, up-to-date information on the stocks of important agricultural products at the global level. And that information, information on what is available where, what are the prices, has contributed greatly to stabilizing markets and to avoid overreactions or panic. So transparency mechanisms, information systems, very important. As already said, I think that in general, the policies that have been introduced in trade have been rather supportive of trade. Those that were restrictive have often been, uh, been withdrawn after a short time. And I think it's also very encouraging that the G20 trade ministers have given out a joint communique. We believe that in the next step, what is going to be important, and it's very much a business that is signaling this to us, is further coordination and communication, in particular around policies regarding border crossing of people. That's important for the tourism industry. It's important for many value chains where uh, staff has to move across borders and coordination cooperation across uh, vaccines and other health-related policies in order to get this um, pandemic under control. Um, more of the course, that's what our business is asking us for coordination and cooperation, more of it, not less. That's, that's for sure. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, maybe to you, uh, Sir Paul, um, again on this issue of uh, importance of public policy in handling COVID. Uh, you mentioned that it doesn't have to be a choice between health and economy. Uh, but do, do you see uh, whether the public policies and the way how they are structured and designed uh, they make an impact on economy and could have lasting impact on global economy itself? How do you see this situation? Well, public policy is enormously important. Um, I, I entirely agree with uh, Marion Jensen that um, uh, trust is at the heart of it. I mean, the, the reason Denmark's done so much better than the United States is the Danish population very largely trusts its government to look after its anxieties and its, its proper concerns, whereas the American population no longer does. Um, but let me come back to the, the, the central point that 
even before COVID. COVID has just exaggerated, amplified problems that have been building up unaddressed for 40 years. Globalization has the potential to benefit everybody, but the reality is that in a lot of OECD countries, half of the population, and indeed the poorer half, has been made worse off, not better off. Um, and um, there have been two big new vicious um, divides um, between a booming metropolis and periodically broken cities, broken by um, as, as uh, manufacturing production moved to East Asia as a result of globalization. Um, that wasn't compensated. And the other, a new divide between people with university education and people without. Um, the people without had invested in manual skills. Those values have declined in, in the OECD countries because of a move of a lot of manual work, either, either um, removed altogether by technology or transferred to, to East Asia. So globalization has the potential to lift all boats, but the reality is that public policy was so poor at addressing these major groups that were losing um, that it's created a backlash. That's why, very understandably, the reaction is protectionism. Um, of course, because these people feel neglected and angry. Uh, so that's the, that's the tragedy. Um, just to demonstrate one dramatic indicator of that is the deaths of despair. The fact that for major groups of the population, life expectancy has actually been falling, falling when technology means it should be rising. Um, and um, Ambassador Wolf uh, sort of congratulated the, the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry over the last 40 years has become an ethical disgrace. It's responsible for quite a lot of these deaths of despair as companies actually decided to profit from encouraging addiction. You can't get worse than that. That is a, that's why these companies are no longer trusted, because they behaved so disgracefully. And so until public policy actually does lift all boats, of course there'll be these backlashes and rising protectionism. You can't blame people. It's not populist nationalism. It's a failure to address the real concerns of ordinary people. Thank you. Very interesting points. Uh, I think uh, one of the issues uh, that uh, maybe we should discuss, or maybe it will be also part of the questions, is that uh, on one hand we all believe that uh, global trade, uh, supply chains, op open free movement of uh, goods and capital, mo uh, movement of people, these are necessary preconditions for the economic recovery. On the other hand, what we see, for example, in the European Union, but also on the national level, is much more focus on what is called strategic sovereignty, um, resilience, even national resilience. Um, so it, it will be interesting to also uh, hear from you how you see the uh, cor correlation between these two things. Is, is it uh, compatible to be global, but at the same time have a strategic sovereignty and uh, resilience, or is it something that actually runs against each other? But let's move from public policies to uh, private sector. And uh, I'm looking at Pierre and uh, EBRD, obviously, as one of the major uh, supporters of uh, uh, private sector and uh, SMEs and companies in Central Eastern Europe. Um, it seems to me that uh, we are still living in a kind of optimistic bubble. Uh, when you look at, uh, at the situation in uh, at least, uh, and again, we are in Slovakia, we, we are in Central Europe, uh, there are different measures taken to make sure that uh, people uh, do not suffer and companies do not suffer too much uh, from the impact of COVID. Uh, people are able to, uh, to postpone the payment of mortgages, of loans. Uh, company, companies do not have to pay uh, or didn't have to pay um, uh, taxes. Uh, there is uh, a lot of support in terms of uh, so-called Kurzarbeit, so the support of governments for the employment schemes. Um, all these, of course, can last only for a certain period of time because otherwise, uh, obviously, uh, the state treasuries and, uh, and uh, budgets will run out of, uh, of, of funds. So uh, how do you see it? Are, are we really in this kind of optimistic bubble? Um, are we facing, uh, when this uh, 
measures are going to expire? Are we facing a major, major problem in terms of the access to finance, in, ex, uh, in terms of uh, survival of, uh, uh, of corporations? We have some sectors like tourism, uh, hotels, uh, anything related to transport, airports, etc., which are suffering a lot. Well, well, how do you see the situation and uh, how is, for example, EBRD reacting to this uh, new environment? Very good questions, uh, Vasil. I think um, in the short term, obviously, uh, you have a general movement uh, with very large f fiscal uh, uh, stimulus packages, uh, which have helped to cushion also, uh, the, the the impact of the of the crisis on individual and firms. And you mentioned that that also creates inequality between. The most advanced country which have the means to do so and others which have less <laughs> the means to do so and uh, in our regions we cover there are huge differences between uh, uh, the most advanced uh, for eu countries for example and uh, and central asian countries <laughs> to, to 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 take uh, extreme examples uh, in the long term uh, obviously the situation is very uncertain. As, as you said, uh, probably we are living a little bit, or, or, or many of us uh, in our countries are living a little bit in a bubble because there are two, two, two issues uh, which are uh, very acute. First, dependency on external support. And, you know, in, in EU countries, uh, thanks to uh, the very uh, reactive um, uh, solutions which have been provided by the EU and EU government, you've you've had more or less access to finance which have been uh, largely pre preserved, which is not the case in all countries. Uh, so when you took Georgia, for example. Uh, Hopefully, uh, the IMF support allowed uh, the government to increase its support package from 2% to 7%, but it's not the case in all countries. The second issue is really uh, very much how you can build over the longer term in the recovery phase, we, we all hope to, to, to see. Um, global FDRs flow to the countries which need that the most. Um, and, and that uh, is uh, something where multilateral uh, institution, financial institution can bring also their contribution. On the fiscal side, also, this is a huge challenge because uh, beyond the, the increase of, uh, of the debt ratio, you have had currency depreci uh, depreciation. So we are rediscovering also the fact that the resilience of the economies depend very much on the capacity of these countries and companies to have access to uh, financing in local currency. That's very much what we are trying to do. As you, uh, as you, you know, 30% um, of our lending is in local currency, which is very high in, in, uh, in, in the family of, uh, of development institutions. Uh, but uh, this is crucial. Last, I would say trade, because this has been mentioned um, and and there is powerful evidence of the value of trade finance. In the first half of 2022, uh, 2020, uh, we uh, as EBRD financed over 1,000 trade deals with a turnover of nearly 2 billion euros. It's a record high in the history of, uh, of uh, obviously, our institution, but more, more generally. And I think having the capacity to uh, support uh, the continuation of uh, trade uh, is as important as having the, the right regulation and framework in place. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to go to uh, Brussels. Um, obviously, Huawei has been quite uh, a lot in the media, in, in the news, um, uh, mostly because of the policies of the, of the Trump administration and some of the sanctions which uh, uh, or limitations on uh, the ability to, of Huawei to get into some of the markets also in uh, Western Europe and other countries, uh, which I see as a trend which obviously is uh, going against the uh, Huawei's opportunity to, to sell and to deploy its products. On the other hand, uh, uh, COVID seems to be uh, uh, in favor of 
companies like Huawei, which, uh, which is very much supporting digitalization, new technologies, uh, IT, etc. Uh, how do you see this interplay and uh, what is Huawei doing to maybe to utilize uh, the impact of COVID uh, for its uh, promotion of business? Uh, thank you very much. You know, <laughs> from Russell's point of view, I mean, I'm sitting here, I look at what is happening in the EU and the uh, certain member states. It's, um, you know, it's sometimes I feel if you read only the, the headline from the media, it's, 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 it seems like Huawei is a, is a stranger who come to Europe like for, it's like a, it's a new guys come to your backyard and you are checking if this, this guy is uh, trustable or not, especially when you're you know, long-term uh, neighbor or, or, or friend tell you this is a bad guy, and then it, I, I see their their policy makers, they are, they are, you know, they are quite complex and or controversial uh, debate on on the top on the topic of Huawei. But in fact, this is the 20th years anniversary of Huawei in Europe. We have won the trust from the operators, European-owned operators. I must remind you that European operators representing the highest competences in terms of the tail cooperation as well as the cyber security. So in a way, your own companies has trusted Huawei for many, many, many years. It's not new. And then the second point I want to make is, you know, along these 20 years of journey, the cornerstone of, our, of Huawei as a company, you know, originate, originally born in China, but embracing the the, the multilateral world rules of law, you know, respect the rules in Europe has been our cornerstone of, a, of, of, the, of the, the business success. And respect all the rules, you know, is supposed to be what the, the business, you know, should do and should be enough for them to do, you know, to, to and then the politics supposed supposed to be handled by the politicians, you know, and then any allegation I remind, you know, the, the audience that, you know, opinion, political opinion, uh, without the factual check, you know, uh, is, is, it has often been proven uh, not reliable. I mean, the, if you check the track record of Huawei, we have been a main contributor in this industry to the, uh, the, the digital economy and ICT infrastructures. According to the uh, independent report from uh, Oxford Institution, we have, uh, based on the financial figures in 2019, we have contributed to the, Europe, to the European GDP of 16.2 billion euros. We support more than 200, 220,000 jobs, and we support 6.2 uh, uh, billion euros of tax revenue to the European authorities. More than 15,000 Huawei employees, which 70, over 70% 70 of them are local, are is, you know, representing the whole family of Huawei in Europe. So in a way, we have been here, we have been part of the ecosystem. You know, I mean, if European uh, decision makers, policy makers really in, look into its own industry uh, interests and the development right of the operators, I, you know, the time, history will finally prove that we will be the trustworthy partner and we will contribute to the digital agenda of European development and also the Green Deal, where the digital technology did indeed play a key role in this case. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very good arguments. Um, now we have a few minutes left, uh, I think 10 minutes uh, until the end of this panel. Uh, first, I would like to ask whether there are any questions from the from the audience uh, or uh, from the our virtual network and uh, virtual audience. I, I don't see any hands here, at least not not in the room. Um, maybe uh, before we end this uh, session, and maybe some questions may come later. Uh, I would like to ask each of you uh, again very briefly to. Uh, try to respond to the question, uh, if you were to define what are, I don't know, two, three most important issues that uh, will be important for the economic recovery, because we are talking about the ailing global economy, uh, what do you think would be those uh, uh, two, three mo most important issues which have to be um, uh, undertaken, decided, uh, 
It could be in the public space, in private sector space, could be related to your organization. But uh, when you look at the economic rec recovery post-COVID, what would you identify as the key priorities uh, uh, for you and your institution, but also for the global economy? Uh, could we start with, the, with uh, uh, Madame Janssen, please? I think in the... Um in the immediate, um, in the immediate, I two terms already mentioned: coordinate and cooperate. That's what um, the business, business is expecting, and that's what uh, will help to maintain things uh, things flowing. And as I already mentioned, the issue of border crossings of people and the issue of how do we get this pandemic under control. I'm thinking here of vaccine will be important. So the second point communication and consultation uh, with all stakeholders. But what I believe we learn in this crisis that when it comes to risk assessment and risk management, the private sector has some lessons to tell us. Um, so we would, um, would advise, and that has happened the case during the crisis, to work with private sector in order to understand that where we think we need um, to have certain products in place at the right time, access to certain things, make sure that this is communicated well and that the solutions that are found are consulted with uh, with business. And the last um, lesson, we uh, very much believe that no country can provide all the items to need you need to deal with the crisis on its markets will continue to be important. In a pandemic like this, you needed masks, you needed uh, gloves, you needed disinfectants, you needed patient monitoring devices, intubation kits, you needed um, disinfectants, and you needed all kinds of other pharmaceuticals. Part of them you will always have to matter, but that openness will have to be rebuilt and maintained with trust. Thank you very much. Very clear message. Uh, I hope we'll be able to work as a global community in this direction, as you, as you just outlined. Ambassador Wolf, uh, what, what do you think are the key, key issues uh, for the success of global economy? Well, you know, uh, the world has been through a variety of crises over time. Uh, in 1934, uh, the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Program began by the United States to lower barriers in the middle of the Depression. In 1948, uh, countries came together and decided that they'd have uh, a, an international trade organization that became the GATT uh, and now the WTO uh, when the devastation of two wars had to be faced. In 1973, the world was divided uh, by non-tariff barriers. That was seen as a major problem and we got international negotiations going and international codes were negotiated. And in 1985, there was a lot of unilateralism, something we've experienced again. Uh, and by 1995, we have a World Trade Organization to have broader understandings on uh, international commerce. Uh, so international cooperation, as Marion said and others have said, is absolutely essential. I agree with uh, Professor Collier uh, with respect to, we were in trouble before pandemic hit. It, it points up some of the greater difficulties that uh, nationalism is not the answer, autarky is certainly not the answer, onshoring is not uh, an answer. Uh, what is needed is uh, cooperation and openness. When I talked about the pharmaceutical agreement, I was not talking about congratulating the pharmaceutical industry. I was talking about don't tax things that you need to meet the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic or for other health reasons. So um, uh, the pharmaceutical agreement covered 90% of world trade when it was negotiated in 1995. It now covers something like 65% of world trade uh, because some major players are not in it. Uh, but that greater openness is an answer. Fairness, we don't explain, yeah, globalization is a real problem for uh, in terms of perception and reality, uh, but it also has major benefits. What the WTO is about, and we don't articulate it enough, is fairness. If you are working in a factory, and you make something that's very good and it's competitive internationally, it ought to be able to be sold internationally. If you're in agriculture and you're farming, then you ought to be able to sell internationally. If you are in, uh, you design an app, uh, an application for uh, a smartphone, uh, as a, a surprising number of folks have done in many remote locations of the world, it ought to be able to be freely accessible by others. 
in international trade. So we're about fairness. We don't say that often enough, and we got, but we got to provide it. Uh, there's a new emphasis on uh, gender, uh, making the, uh, uh, the world trade system work better for women. Uh, there are areas that are very harmful to women in agriculture and uh, in industry as well. Uh, and uh, micro and medium and small enterprises have to be able to participate to a far greater extent than they do. And we're finally turning to those issues. Uh, so uh, uh, as well as the new issues, uh, new for us anyway, environment, uh, there will be uh, proposals and actually measures, uh, carbon tax, border taxes. We have to find out how to, how to work that through on an international cooperative basis. So uh, with climate change, we really have to deal with the environment. Uh, consumer preferences have to be listened to. And uh, workers who uh, uh, have to be uh, taken care of in terms of the responsiveness of the international trading system to their needs. I think we can do it. And I think we'll have some renewal with the new uh, Director General uh, in that direction. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, maybe briefly from uh, Abraham Liu, uh, from your perspective, what are the key issues you would, you would underline for the recovery? Actually, uh, you know, if you look at the history of the telecommunication, you know, 10 or 10, 15 years ago, the whole world, we have three standards. So when you travel from Europe to America, you have to change your smartphone. And then the tariff used to be high. And then with the global collaboration, you know, the, with the experts or the international company from the U.S., from Europe and China, in the 4G era, we have the unified LTE standard. And then later to the common 5G standards, which has been, uh, you know, formed up in the European-based bodies, 3GPP and ETSI. And then I think globally, for, during this pandemic especially, the, the, the unified standard based on the global collaboration have greatly reduced the cost of the, not only the, the smart devices, but also the, the, the telecommunication data, you know, uh, communication video call, you know, in a big, uh, you know, uh, um, scale. And this proved that the, the, you know, ICT actually is, a, is a, one of the most global coordinated industry you know, one of the biggest, you know, lessons we have learned, not only the importance of the digital technology, which has been, which has played an important role during the pandemic, to support the work, you know, remote medi medical communication, you know, telework and so on and so forth, but also remind a whole human being, you know, we have the common enemy, which is not to f put finger between people, is to, we have the common enemy, which is, like the, the pandemic, you know, the, like COVID-19. This needs even much more collaboration in a global scale. The multilateral organization like WTO, like WHO, you know, OECD, all these international organizations, your role is going to be more important, especially when we see the certain, you know, superpower is more and more play the kind of unilateral approach try to disrupt this global collaboration or decoupling the technology. That will potentially have a big negative impact to the whole human being society combating the, 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 the COVID-19 pan pandemic. I think there are a lot more challenges for the human society in you know, climate change and so on and so forth. I, 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 we as a company who has benefited for the, global, for the globalization and global, global co cooperation, global supply chain, we really depend on the international society here in Europe, European Union, the other international uh, you know, platform to form up the global uh, political trust to restore the new normal of the global collaboration. And uh, I believe all the industry players, including the one from our, you know, the, the industry peers from the US, we will all appreciate the, the, this kind of certainty brought by you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Liu. Um, Pierre, from your side. Yes, uh, very briefly, three, uh, three points on my side. I think first, uh, building on, on the remarks which have been made, I think we 
have to deal seriously with the imbalances which in fact this crisis have more or less uh, highlighted uh, these imbalances which led also to increasing distrust in institutions, in globalization, um, and that uh, requires also tackling the issue of inequalities in, uh, in a different way. And probably the private sector has a very big role to play in that uh, beyond the incentives which are designed by uh, public authorities. The second point, I think, is very much that Obviously, we mentioned a lot of the challenges ahead, but it is uh, also a huge opportunity to build back better, as we say. Uh, so focusing on, on a transition to more resilient, but also more green and more digital economies. Digitalization is a source of, uh, of uh, potential uh, sustainable development, which is huge. And I, 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 I will not go in detail, but we, what we see from Morocco to Mongolia, to the Western Balkans, there there is a catch-up uh, also potential which is huge. Um, there is also a potential, I, I would completely support what has been said about free trade, but uh, around diversification of supply chains, uh, because it offers also opportunities to, to, to countries which were probably more remote from, from, from these opportunities. Last point, uh, referring to what you mentioned, Vazel, which I think is a very um, important and potentially dangerous debate, uh, which is around sovereignty. <laughs> um, we have to find a balanced approach to sovereignty, where sovereignty is not about uh, inward lookingness, uh, about thinking that you are self-sufficient and you don't don't need others to solve your 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 problems, but very much combining both a, a project which deal with the the concerns of the citizens, but which is open to cooperation and to the fact that uh, obviously uh, others can help and be part of the solution. So solidarity is as important probably in the in in this period than. Uh, than sovereignty. Thank you very much, Pierre. Uh, actually, time is up for the panel, but uh, let's uh, also hear to the wisdom, listen to the wisdom of academia. Uh, Sir Paul, what, what are your, your views on what are the key issues? Thank you. Thank you. So, um, we need um, both harmonization and variation. If you know what to do about something, you need to harmonize on it. If you don't know what to do about it, such as COVID, you need variation so you can learn. Uh, I just come back to public policy over the last few years has been really very poor. We've harmonized things that shouldn't have been harmonized, and we've um, uh, varied things that shouldn't have been varied. So to give you a couple of examples, the OECD is doing really good work trying to harmonize the variation in tax policies. Um, uh, good luck to it. That's a very important thing. Corporate tax rates are so varied, uh, we've had a race to the bottom. Um, what else do we need to harmonize? I congratulate the EBRD on its uh, Vienna initiative, which coordinated banks in southeastern Europe so that they wouldn't all um, f leave um, during the global financial crisis. Um, we need that now in Africa. Who is going to coordinate the international banks to make sure that they don't leave Africa? Nobody's done it yet. Um, Place-based policies. Um, we need uh, um, a lot of experiment here, variation, to know what works best to revive broken communities. Um, and we don't know how to do that, so we need variation, and we gradually should learn from that variation. And that's something, learning from variation, that again, the OECD can do a lot of things uh, to, to help on. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we are actually over time. I'm getting some uh, reminders that we should finish. But uh, uh, I would like to thank you all, especially our, our panelists, all those uh, here, but also those who were linked uh, uh, virtually uh, through Zoom and other ways. Um, I think it was an excellent discussion uh, for me. The, main uh, kind of takeaway from this is that uh, uh, if you want to be successful coming out of the ailing 
global economy, economy as, we, as we call it, we have to work together. We need international global cooperation supported by, uh, by economic restructuring, uh, which has to be driven by green and digital economy. And this has to be supported by public-private partnerships. So I think this was a very clear message from this panel. Thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon, lunch for those who are going to, uh, to eat. And uh, again, thank you. Big thank you to our panelists. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.